Und ja, meine Botschaft da, aber meine Botschaft auch jeden Tag in den über 560 Tagen im letzten Jahr ist, wir helfen euch nicht nur, sondern wir stehen an eurer Seite, solange ihr uns braucht. This is my video update from Nicosia, Cyprus on this Tuesday morning, September the 12th. Let's talk about some news and let's, uh, let's start things off with the EU confiscation story and Yesterday in my clown world, I, uh, I talked about how the European Commission, they came out with a statement saying that any Russian uh, travelers or tourists to the European Union, they risk having their personal belongings confiscated by EU member states because those personal belongings could fall into the EU-Russia sanctions uh, list, sanctions policy. And this started out with, uh, with cars because Russians were, were traveling from Russia into the European Union with, uh, with their cars. And some of the Russian travelers, they were making it to Germany and the German authorities were actually confiscating those cars. They were confiscating the cars of Russian citizens. And basically what uh, the German authorities were saying was that uh, these cars or parts in these cars were uh, under sanctions. And so it's their obligation, their right to confiscate these automobiles. And, uh, and then the European uh, Union Commission, they took things a whole lot further. I mean, they really escalated this, this issue. It's not... I mean, it's not bad enough that they're confiscating the automobiles of uh, Russian travelers and Russian tourists in the European Union. But the EU Commission actually said that, uh, that Russians traveling to the EU and, uh, and bringing with them uh, mobile phones, uh, luggage, <laughs> luggage, uh, toiletries, uh, what else, uh, shampoo, Toilet paper, because toilet paper is on the sanctions list. If Russians enter the European Union with these things, well, the, well, the, uh, the EU member state where they, where they travel to can confiscate these items, can steal, can steal these items. So imagine you're a Russian tourist and you, uh, you travel to Greece and you pass through... Uh, through uh, passport control, you make it through the passport control and then you go to customs and the customs uh, agent in Greece decides to enforce the EU sanctions policy and says, you know what, uh, I'm going to take your luggage, I'm going to take your shampoo, I'm going to take your toilet paper, I don't know why you'd be traveling with toilet paper, but uh, whatever, I'm going to take your mobile phone and welcome to Greece. Right. I mean, that's that's pretty much the message that the EU is uh, is putting out there. Now, what the uh, what the EU Commission said is that they're going to allow Russians traveling into the European Union. They will allow them to at least keep their clothes and their shoes so they won't confiscate the clothes that you're that you're wearing and and the clothes in your luggage and your shoes. They'll let you keep those things, but everything else is fair game. So this, uh, this statement from the EU Commission, it, it, it angered, to, to say it mildly, it angered. Uh, Maria Zaharova, it angered Dmitry Medvedev. I think it angered everybody in Russia. I mean, whether you're, you're, uh, you're in the Kremlin or whether you're just, uh, just an average Russian citizen looking to take a holiday in Europe, I mean, this infuriated everybody. And so Maria Zaharova, she just came out and said, this is just pure racism. She says what the EU is doing is racist towards Russians. And if they're doing it towards Russians, it means they're going to do it towards other, uh, 
other cultures, as ethnicities as well. Keep that in mind. Always keep that in mind. And eventually, they're going to turn these policies towards their very own citizens. That's always the way these things go. So always keep that in mind. Anyway, Maria Zaharova, she said that this is just, just a racist action. Dmitry Medvedev, he said that this is not only racist, but he said that this is a spit in the face towards Russia, towards Russian citizens. This is a spit in the face. That's what Medvedev said. And, uh, and Medvedev, he also said that, that Russia, unlike the EU, is not racist. And any EU citizens traveling to Russia do not have to fear the uh, Russian authorities confiscating their items and their personal belongings. Medvedev said that uh, EU tourists and travelers are welcome to, uh, to visit Russia. They don't have to worry about Russia doing, uh, doing what the EU is doing to, to Russian travelers. Russia is not going to do the same. But uh, Medvedev did say that perhaps it's time for Russia to cut off diplomatic ties with EU member states that actually enforce this uh, EU confiscation sanctions policy. So that is what uh, Medvedev said. So what, what do I think is going on here? Well, I think that, uh, that this is part of the, the collective West uh, pressure tactics towards Russia in order to get the Russian government to agree to a conflict freeze. That's what I think is going on here. I think the United States, they called up, let's walk down that way because I think it's gonna to start to get noisy here. I think that, uh, that the Blinken uh, Department of State, they called up Ursula and they told Ursula to, to come out with this outrageous policy, this outrageous statement, because this is just one piece of a much bigger plan from the, uh, the Biden White House, from the neocons, from Blinken, the Department of State, to, uh, to get Russia to, to agree to a Ukraine conflict freeze, which is what, what the plan is right now for Project Ukraine, to freeze the conflict in a Korea type of armistice. And so I think in the next three to six months, I think we're gonna see a lot of escalation from the collective West, militarily, diplomatically, financially, uh, sanctions, but also on a, on a very personal uh, level. I mean, I think the collective West is going to start to really, really do some very disgusting, racist, provocative things towards Russia and towards Russians because their calculus is that uh, that Russians are going to be so outraged and so uh, and so upset with uh, with these types of, of actions from the European Union that it's going to make life difficult for the Putin government. And eventually the Kremlin is going to say, OK, you know, uh, you want a conflict freeze? Let's have a conflict freeze. But, you know, enough of this nonsense, enough of of uh, of confiscating our citizens, personal belongings when they travel to the European Union. So that's what I think is going on here. I think this is just one one small piece to a much bigger plan, much bigger uh, puzzle that the Blinken State Department is putting together in order to force Russia into, into the acceptance of a conflict freeze, which is what, uh, what the plan is. That is what, uh, what Blinken wants. That's why he went to Ukraine and stayed there for two days. That's why he broke the news to Alensky that, uh, that the plan is a conflict freeze, the counteroffensive, the big super duper counteroffensive did not work out, and uh, we now have to uh, just just agree to freeze this conflict where it is, and um, and the U.S. has to deal with with elections. That's pretty much the the plan going forward. And as I discussed in my video 
Yesterday, the narrative that, uh, that the Biden White House, that the Democrats, because this is much bigger than the Biden White House, the narrative that the Democrats are going to, to put out there for the, for the American public as we get into election mode is that uh, the Ukraine policy was successful. It was money well spent. Uh, Putin did not accomplish his ultimate goal, which according to to the U.S. government was to subsume Ukraine into the Russian Federation. Putin did not accomplish this. And all the money that was poured into Ukraine weakened the Russian government, weakened the Russian military, caused uh, a Prigozhin Wagner mutiny and, and all of these things, blah, blah, blah. You guys know the, the talking points. And all of this was done without the United States having to fire one, one shot, right? That's gonna be the narrative that they put together. So this was Project Ukraine was money well spent. This was a loss for Putin. But uh, in order to, to de-escalate, in order to come to some sort of peace in Ukraine, the, uh, the Biden White House has, uh, has gone along with the Alensky regime's desire because as Blinken said in the interview that he gave to ABC News, if Ukraine signals that they're open to negotiations, Blinken said, will support Ukraine as, the nego as they negotiate. So their job is to, is to push the Alensky regime to approach Russia and to say, let's freeze the conflict. And then the Biden White House can say, well, as per Ukraine's wishes, we supported them in a freeze of the conflict. And uh, the Russians are gonna hold on to the territory that they have, but we will never recognize this territory as Russian. And on our end, as the United States, as the collective West, we're gonna move forward with uh, security guarantees for Ukraine. We'll, uh, we'll discuss NATO, we'll discuss the European Union. And, uh, and you know what else? We can, we can get, uh, we can get Rheinmetall and Lockheed and Raytheon and all of these MIC companies. They can they can start to build their factories in in the uh, in in the sovereign, as Blinken called it, the sovereign part of Ukraine. They can they can build their production facilities there, and Monsanto can can do what it's going to do with land, and BlackRock can do what it's going to do with, with business and land and property. And, and that's how they're going to play this thing. That's, that's their hope. That's their hope of, uh, of an off ramp to, uh, to conflict Ukraine. And, you know, um, Blinken, he gave it all away at this ABC interview as, uh, as far as a conflict freeze is concerned, because in his statement to ABC news, this is what Blinken said. And I quote, it takes two to tango, and thus far, we see no indication that Vladimir Putin has any interest in meaningful diplomacy. If he does, I think the Ukrainians will be the first to engage and will be right behind them. Everyone wants this war to end, but it has to stand on just terms and durable terms that reflect Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Now, Alexander, in his video update from yesterday, he broke this statement down from Blinken. And I mean, he, he really broke this statement down and he got to, to the essence of what Blinken was saying in this statement. And he focused in on, on the word reflect, the last sentence and the word reflect. It has to stand on just terms and durable terms that reflect Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And Alexander said that the word reflect, that's, that gives it away. That gives away Blinken and the State Department's plan to freeze the conflict. Blinken is not talking about 1991 borders. He's, uh, he's not talking about Ukraine uh, taking back territory that Russia controls. He's... Uh, He's not talking about uh, Crimea. He's not talking about any of these, uh, these things. He doesn't even mention any of these talking points that they've mentioned for the past year and a half. What Blinken is saying is that whatever agreement is reached has to reflect 
Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, which when you break it all down is Blinken saying, if we freeze the conflict, Russia, you keep what you have, but we're not gonna recognize it. What's left of Ukraine is going to be the sovereign Ukraine. That's going to be the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And that's gonna be the Ukraine that we provide security guarantees towards. And that's gonna be the Ukraine that, uh, that eventually gets into NATO and eventually gets into the European Union. That's, that is what Blinken is saying in this last sentence when he uses the word reflect Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. It's one of the few times that the collective West is not saying 1991 borders. It's one of the few times that the collective West is not saying that we're going to, uh, to fight for as long as it takes. We're gonna support Ukraine for as long as it takes. Now you have Blinken saying that, what is, uh, what is the reality on the ground? right now is going to to reflect Ukraine's current sovereign position. That's basically what uh, what Blinken is saying. And you know, when Blinken was in Kiev, he actually said something very interesting. He uh, he said that Ukraine has managed the Ukraine military has done such a great job in this conflict because what they have managed to do is to actually take back 50 percent of the of the territory that Russia initially uh, captured in the opening uh, months of the special military operation. Now, I don't know if it's 50 percent. I think it's something around maybe 20, 25 percent or 27 percent or 17 percent. I've heard different numbers, but uh, the Ukraine military hasn't taken back 50 percent of what Russia took in the opening phase of the special military operation. You're looking at Kharkov and and half of of uh, Kherson, or forty percent of Kherson, and that's pretty much it. But uh, the Ukraine military—they've lost uh, Bakhmut, and they've lost uh, other other areas in Ukraine. Anyway, Ukraine has managed over the past year and a half to to take back some territory that Russia initially took in the opening phases of the special military operation, mostly due to the fact that Russia uh, decided to pull back and decided to. Uh, to move back to to better to a better defensive position, so it was more like Russia voluntarily ceded this territory to this territory to Ukraine in order to better its defensive position than Ukraine actually fighting to take this territory. But anyway, that doesn't matter. Uh, what I want to focus on is Blinken's statement, where he said in Kiev that Ukraine has managed to gain back 50% of the land that Russia initially took in the start of the SMO. When you, when you read into, into Blinken's statements, you come to the understanding that this was not really Blinken praising the Ukraine military or the Oletsky regime. This was Blinken telling Ukraine and telling the Oletsky regime, we're freezing this conflict and stop complaining. You guys managed to get back 50% of the territory that Russia took in the beginning you have nothing to complain about. At least you got something back. So we're freezing this. Don't complain. Don't whine. You got something after a year and a half of fighting. So take it. Take it and stop complaining. That's basically what Blinken was really trying to tell the Alensky regime. So in the, in the video that I made yesterday, I talked about how this, uh, this conflict freeze is, uh, is all well and good. It's, I guess if you're a neocon, if you're, if you're Newland or Blinken, Sullivan, Biden, whatever's left of Biden, you know, as a neocon, you're probably like, yeah, this is a good plan. Freeze the conflict like, uh, like Korea and, or like Germany. And we'll, we'll spend the next 10 or 20 years to, to work towards getting Ukraine into NATO and getting Ukraine into the European Union. And eventually, after 10, 20, 30 years, Russia will, uh, will break down and we'll, we'll get what we wanted after like 10, 20, 30 years, something like, uh, like what happened with, 
with West and, and East Germany, something along those lines. That's kind of like how they're, how they're picturing this, this plan uh, playing out. But as I said in my video yesterday, you have, uh, you have one big problem, which is Russia. How do you get Russia on board? And then you have the other problem, which is how do you get Alensky, the Alensky regime, to agree to all of this? So the Russia piece to the puzzle is we have to go back to, to the EU confiscation sanctions uh, statement. The way the collective West is going to try to get Russia to agree to this freeze is by using mafia tactics. This is the way the collective West engages in diplomacy. It's, it's mafia style. That's the way they've always done it. That's the way they're going to continue to do it. And so they're going to come out with schemes like, uh, like confiscating Russian tourists shampoo or smartphone as they enter the EU to make life miserable or difficult for, uh, for everyday Russian tourists, Russian travelers. They're going to, to do things like, um, like providing attackums to the, to the uh, Ukraine military or tourist missiles to the Alensky regime so that the Alensky regime can, uh, can hit uh, Crimea, can hit deep inside of uh, Russian territory. Um, they're going to they're gonna continue to provide surveillance and... Um, and help to the Ukraine military to launch drones. That that's goal is that that the goal is to, to hit Moscow or to hit Rostov or to hit Crimea. They're going to continue to do all these things in order to panic and terrorize Russia. And eventually, they're they're hoping that Russia is going to say enough already. We're sick of the drones. We're sick of the attackums and the Taurus missiles. We'll agree to a freeze. So they're going to use these tactics. Um, they also, you know, they also use these, these types of media threats. And, uh, and, and the other day, uh, Milley, he, uh, he gave an interview to, I think it was to CBS News or to ABC News or to NBC News. I don't know. It's all the same. Anyway, he gave an interview from the, the command center of Project Ukraine, the Collective West command center of Project Ukraine. And that was... I was watching this interview and I was like, that's interesting. Milly is, is showing the, the mainstream media around the command center, Project Ukraine. I remember the, the guy that was interviewing Milly was like, um, you know, you, you guys say that you're not a, a party to this conflict, but, you know, here I am at your command center where you guys are pretty much, you know, running the war. How can you, how can you claim that you're not fighting Russia? And Milly was just kind of like, you know, uh, what are you talking about? We're not a party to this war. We're just helping Ukraine defend itself, right? That was, he just, he just repeated the script that, that he's been taught to, to recite whenever he gets a question like, like that, you know, we're, we're not a party to this conflict. We're just helping Ukraine defend itself. But I mean, it was all there, the entire command center. And I'm like, you know, why are they showing this? Why, why is this on, on TV? And I think the reason that they're showing it is, is once again to, to play into this, this, this full court press of, of getting Russia to agree to a conflict freeze, because this is the collective West's way of telling Russia, telling Russian uh, citizens who are watching this video, telling the, the Kremlin, telling the Russian military, you know, we're, we're watching you. We are a part of this conflict. We see what's going on and, and, we, can, and we can hit you or we're going to try to hit you. That's, that's basically the, the threat of this, uh, of this interview, at least in my opinion. That's how I saw it. So I thought that was a really interesting uh, interview and video that, uh, that came out. So I think, you know, the whole, the whole point of, uh, of freezing the conflict, at least with, uh, with, uh, with Russia, trying to get Russia to agree to a conflict freeze, is that the collective West is just going to pile on the pressure in the next three to six months. I mean, they're just going to pile on the pressure and they're going to do everything they can to, uh, to make life absolutely miserable for Putin, for the Kremlin, for Russian citizens, uh, for the Russian military, for the Russian language and culture and history. You name it, they're going to go after it because their goal is to, uh, is to get Russia to just say, okay, 
I'm tired of this. Enough already. Let's freeze this, uh, this thing. That's their goal. That's why you're having uh, these NATO drills. That's why you have uh, um, these, these drones in Romania and the constant threats about Article 5. Uh, drone fragments in Romania. It's all about uh, pressure, escalation, trying to, uh, to spook Russia, trying to scare Russia. You know, look, a drone in Romania. You guys don't want Article 5 uh, triggered, do you? You guys don't want Article 5. Look, a drone, in, uh, a drone fragment in Poland. You guys don't want Article 5. Let's, let's have uh, a NATO military drill in Romania. Let's have uh, UK planes over the over the Black Sea, all, all of this stuff, it's, it's all part of the same, uh, the same uh, uh, plan. It's all part of the same plan to, to pressure Russia into agreeing to a freeze. Anyway, I've, I've been rambling on long enough. I think you guys know what I'm getting towards. How am I doing on time? I'm doing all right on time. I'll wrap this up. I will wrap this up with the Ukraine side of things. So how do you get Ukraine on board? And so Blinken in Kiev representing the U.S., this is the plan. Boris in Kiev telling uh, Alensky, you know, Boris is Alensky's BFF. He's his mentor. He's his best buddy. Boris comes into, uh, into Kiev, travels to Kiev, and he says the U.K. is also on board with Blinken's plan. And then Annalena 360 Baerbach travels to Kiev, and she, she tells Alensky, Germany, is on board with uh, a conflict freeze plan, as is the European Union. We are also on board with, uh, with a conflict freeze. And Annalena, she, uh, she brings with her EU membership. That's what she brings with her. EU membership for Ukraine. Now, in the video I made yesterday, I said that this EU membership provides Zelensky with safety and cover because if, if and when Zelensky starts to uh, inform Ukraine citizens, and especially the, uh, the Bandera forces in the government and in the west of Ukraine, that there is going to be a conflict freeze and Russia is going to hold on to the territory that, uh, that they currently hold on to, Zelensky would be in big, big trouble. So he needs something. He needs something to give the, the masses, especially the, the West Ukraine Banderites. And that something is possible EU membership in a couple of years. And that is what Annalena brought with her. But, you know, I think Annalena also brought with her a bit of a, of a threat. No, that's not the word that I'm looking for. I think, I, th I think EU membership, the EU membership that Annalena is dangling in front of Alensky so, uh, so that he can get on board with a conflict freeze, I think it also acts as a bit of blackmail towards, uh, towards the Alensky regime because it's, it's Annalena, it's the European Union uh, telling Alensky, look, if you don't go along with the conflict freeze, if you don't play nice and go along with our plan, if you resist, then we can take away the EU membership as well. And if we take away the EU membership from you, the Lodomir, you're toast. You are toast. Those Banderites, they are going to eat you alive. So I think it's the EU membership is a bit of a carrot, but it can also act as, uh, as a stick as well. And so I think that was the message that the EU is bringing to Alenska. And keep in mind, this, this cannot be Annalena saying this. Annalena could just be the cover. I don't think she's smart enough to... Uh, <laughs> to convey these, uh, these, um, these ideas to uh, this plan to Olensky. I'm sure that she's being accompanied by all kinds of other people, deep state people who are, who are not in, uh, in the photos or in the videos and they're sitting down with the Olensky regime and they're telling the Olensky regime, this is the plan. We can give you EU membership, so at least you have something to, to tell the people 
at least you're getting something out of this conflict freeze, which is going to be EU and uh, NATO membership, possible EU and NATO membership. So we're not going to leave you empty handed. But if you resist uh, Mr. Elensky, well, you're not going to have anything. And we are going to move forward with a conflict freeze and you're going to be uh, toast because you're not going to have anything to show for after a year and a half of fighting and hundreds of thousands of uh, Ukrainian soldier casualties and lost territory. And so I think that's that's the message that they brought Alensky. And, and why do I say this? Well, I say this because yesterday we had two very interesting articles come out. One article was from Politico, citing an EU official who told Politico that EU membership for Ukraine could be very problematic because Ukraine is so corrupt. Now, this was a this was a European Union official telling Politico this, of course, an anonymous official, as they always are anonymous. But uh, he's telling Politico that, you know, I don't know if Ukraine can get into the EU because we just suddenly discovered just suddenly we suddenly discovered that Ukraine is pretty corrupt. I don't know. You know how it happened all this time, all these years, we thought that that, that Ukraine was was, uh, you know, a law abiding human rights uh, rule of law country. And now all of a sudden we just discovered that it's corrupt. How about that? <laughs> how about that? You know, we just discovered this corruption. So that's what this official told Politico. And I'm scratching my head going, come on, man. <laughs> come on now. <laughs> Now the EU discovers that uh, membership for Ukraine in the European Union could be problematic because it's corrupt. Now you discover this? Come on, dude. <laughs> Who are you trying to fool? And then you had this poll come out. This poll, this survey of Ukrainian citizens who say that uh, the corruption is, uh, is Alensky's fault. 78% of Ukrainians blame Alensky for the corruption in the country. Now, why would this poll come out at this time? All of a sudden, you have an EU official saying that maybe Ukraine may not get into the European Union because of corruption. Oh, and by the way, we just happened uh, to conduct a poll and we're going to publish the results of the poll. And uh, those results don't look too good for Alensky. 78% of Ukrainians think that he's corrupt. You know, if you're Alensky, you accept the conflict freeze, right? <laughs> that's, that's the way I saw it. Anyway, that's, uh, that, that's, that's, how I, that's how I saw things. You know, with Annalena's visit, with Blinken's visit, with, uh, with this Politico article about Ukraine corruption, this poll. The EU, the collective West, is telling Alensky, take the deal, take the conflict, freeze, go to your people, tell them that we're freezing the conflict, tell them that you're uh, going to work to get NATO membership, tell them that the EU has promised you EU membership, and uh, we're all good. And uh, as the United States, we can focus on the election. That's... That's the plan, man. <laughs> that is the plan. Now, you know, Alensky, he's, he's trying to digest all of this. You know, I think he's having a hard time uh, accepting all of this. And uh, there's a part of him that I think is starting to accept this. You know, that's why he went on, uh, on CNN and he talked to Fareed Zahadia and he said, uh, he said this is going to be a long war. And then he, he put out a statement on his, uh, his TikTok Instagram account and he told the people of Ukraine, this is going to be a long and difficult war. So I think there's a part of him that's accepting this. But I think there's also a part of him, very much like a spoiled child who's, who's getting uh, his toys taken away from him. I think there's a part of him which is, start, which is starting to, to rebel and to, and to resist. And, and he gave an interview to The Economist. And uh, this is what he said. This is what Alensky told The Economist. Or this is how The Economist framed this interview. And I quote, he opens his hands in a gesture of frustration, talking about Alensky. Some partners might see Ukraine's recent difficulties on the battlefield as a reason to force it into negotiations with Russia. But this is a bad moment since, since Putin sees the same. 
Tapping loudly on the table, Mr. Alensky rejects outright the idea of compromise with Vladimir Putin. War will continue for as long as Russia remains on Ukrainian territory, he says. A negotiated deal would not be permanent. The Russian president has a habit of creating frozen conflicts on Russia's borders, in Georgia, for example, not as ends in themselves, but because his goal is to restore the Soviet Union. Those who choose to talk to the man in the Kremlin are tricking themselves, much like the Western leaders who signed an agreement with Hitler at Munich in 1938, only to watch him invade Czechoslovakia. The mistake is not diplomacy. The mistake is diplomacy with Putin. He negotiates only with himself. So, you know, the giveaway in the statement that, uh, that Blinken is telling Alensky to freeze the conflict is when Blinken says the Russian president has a habit of creating frozen conflicts. That's Alensky's projection. There you have it. That's how you know that, uh, that they want Alensky to freeze the conflict because he's saying that Putin has a habit of freezing conflicts. So he gives it away. He gives it away in, uh, in the statement. You can see he is rebelling a bit. He's rebelling to the, to the uh, armistice plan, right? I, I, can't, I can't negotiate with Putin. I will not negotiate with Putin. Uh, anyone that wants me to negotiate with Putin is a fool. He's just, going to, uh, he's just going to invade all of Europe. If you don't give me more money and more weapons and you force me to negotiate with Putin, trust me, he's going to invade uh, Czechoslovakia like Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia. That's his statement right here, right? That's basically what, what Alensky is saying. And then Alensky threatens Europe. He threatens the collective West. Curtailing aid to Ukraine will only prolong the war, Mr. Zelensky argues, and it would create risks for the West in its own backyard. There is no way of predicting how the millions of Ukrainian refugees in European countries would react to their country being abandoned. Ukrainians have generally behaved well and are very grateful to those who sheltered them. They will not forget that, generos that generosity, but it would not be a good story for Europe if it were to drive these people into a corner. You know, Alensky is having a, a temper tantrum. He is acting like a child here and he is telling Europe, you know, if, if you force me, if you force me to negotiate with Putin, then this is what's gonna happen. Putin's going to invade Europe. And by the way, you're gonna have uh, Banderites running around the EU causing all, all kinds of trouble. That's what he's saying, it's a threat. It's a threat, it's a tamper tantrum, it's a threat. He's, he's trying, he's, he, I guess he's, he's inching towards the stage of acceptance of this uh, freeze plan, but he still can't quite get there. And other people like Kaluba, other people in Alensky's uh, team, well, you know, they're also having a hard time accepting this. Uh, they're kind of thinking, you know, um, we can still win. Just give us the Taurus missiles, give us the attackums, give us the F-16s, give us more drones. We can still pull this out. We can still win. We can, we can show the collective West that we can defeat Russia if you just give us the attackums. That's why Kaluba lashed out at uh, Annalena, right? Annalena has no clue. She doesn't know what's going on. There are people that were traveling with her that were, that were breaking the news to Alensky and putting together the, the plan and, and the deal that Alensky has to sign up to. Annalena was just there to, to read some statements and she couldn't even do that, right? 560 days in a year. I mean, she's... She's completely lost. But Kaluba, you know, he, he lashed out at her. He's like, just give us the attackums. Give us the, uh, the Taurus. Just give us the Taurus missiles. Why are you holding back on the Taurus missiles? Give us the Taurus missiles. It's going to give us a little bit more time, a little bit more space, and we'll show you that we can uh, strike at Russia. So we don't, have to, we don't have to go forward with this freeze plan. Right? We can still do it. It's, 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 it reminds me of that video of... Uh, of Hitler in his bunker, right? He, he doesn't know what's going on and he still, he still believes that Germany can win World War II, right? That's, that's basically what's, what's happening with a lot of uh, Alensky's uh, production staff that make up his government. Some people in his government uh, want, the, want the missiles and the money and the F-16s. They want all these things because they want to cash out. <laughs> Some people in his team are like, you know, let's just, let's just get whatever weapons and money we can get over the next three to six months and let's let's just plan our our exit out of this thing you know like reznikov reznikov is already uh, house hunting in in london so some people are like yeah just give us the taurus 
give us these missiles. We'll, we'll get some of this stuff to the black market. Give us some more uh, financial aid and, you know, we'll, uh, we'll be able to, to make our exit in the next six to nine months. And then you guys can, can freeze whatever you want to freeze. We don't care. We'll be living in a villa in, in Italy or we're in a huge mansion in, uh, in London. So anyway, that's, uh, yeah, that's how I see things. This is a bit of a different video for me, actually. Uh, not so much talking about headlines in the news, but just kind of giving a breakdown of, of everything that's, that's going down, trying to connect some dots. Maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe I'm kind of in the middle. Maybe I get some of this right. Maybe I get some of this wrong. Time will tell. I th I'm pretty confident in, in this analysis, actually. Uh, but, you know, a lot can change. You know, the, the neocons, this is their plan, but, you know, I think it's pretty clear that Russia's not going to sign up to this. And Alensky and his team, they're, they're providing some pushback. So we'll see. Maybe they decide, you know what? Uh, we tried with Alensky. We offered him uh, some carrots. We even uh, hit him with a stick, but, you know, he's not coming around. So we have to put a new guy uh, in, in his place who will agree to, to what we want to have happen. And all of this, of course, is taking place with, uh, with the elections and, uh, and the Joe Biden who's, who's lost. And it looks like the, uh, the Democrat party with each passing day, they're losing confidence in Biden and they're trying to find a replacement. And they're, they're starting to warm up to Kamala, but there's still doubts. And you have the investigation of Biden and Hunter. And you know, I think that's a whole separate video. Maybe I'll, I'll talk about that in a separate video, but you know, maybe, the powers that be are just looking to tie this whole thing up, you know, cut Biden loose, cut Ukraine loose, uh, start focusing in on China. That's why you have Chinese spies in the UK. That's why you have Liz, Tr Liz Truss with the book that she's uh, putting out, which talks about how China is the number one uh, enemy of the collective West. Maybe this is the plan. This, maybe this is how they make the shift, you know, during a crazy election where everyone is, 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 is losing their minds and, and people are, are focused on, uh, on Biden and, and Trump and the election cycle and, and all of these things going on and, and everyone is, is super hyper, uh, hyper polarized. Maybe this is how they're gonna make the shift happen. Tie up Project Ukraine, freeze up Project Ukraine, remove uh, Biden, get rid of the Biden, Hunter Biden a headache and and then focus in on China, which is, which is another neocon geopolitical uh, goal that they've uh, set out to accomplish. Anyway, let's do a quick clown world since we're talking about Biden. How about Biden? Yeah, how about Biden in Vietnam kissing the memorial of John McCain? This is the, the spot where John McCain uh, was shot down and where he was captured in Vietnam. Why, why does Vietnam have a memorial to John McCain? I, I have no idea. I really have no idea. I, I, I would imagine that uh, they, would, they would demolish that memorial. I don't know. Maybe it's not a memorial in, in honor of John McCain. Maybe it's condemning John McCain. I don't know. I just don't understand why there's a memorial for John McCain. But anyway, there's this memorial for John McCain. And uh, Biden visits this memorial and he kisses the memorial, you know, like, like in, uh, in Greek Orthodox, in the Greek Orthodox religion, we see an icon, you know, we, we make our cross and we kiss the icon. This is Biden kissing the memorial of John McCain. Bizarre, cringe, weird. But you know, McCain was the, the chief priest of neocons and Biden is a neocon, always has been a neocon. So I guess he's just kissing the, the icon of, the, of one of the, the, chief, uh, the chief religious saints of, uh, of neoconservatism, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It was bizarre. Anyway, that's the video, everybody. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, and X and also go to the Durant shop. 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.